Good evening. Shalom Aleichem and uh, regards from New York. Welcome to the Shear tonight on uh, Parshas Kairach, Thursday of Parshas Kairach. So let's go straight to the first question. And this came up in the learning of the Ticha last week. Talks about the difference of Hashgacha Protis between part in this is in Chelikut Chesa Lukutasichas and part of the project Lukutasichas program. Talking about the difference between Hashgacha Protis on Eden and Amos Sa'olam. So it came up a Zedloshan, which the Rebbe very often would, would say, how a Ben Noyach does not have Bechira Chafshis. And I was intrigued. What does it mean that he doesn't have Bechira Chafshis? So here we have a quote from the Rebbe's letters. Um, where he writes about the union of Bechira, of Umar Sa'olam, of. Uh, so then he has a references to various places in. In Chesidus, the Kutat Torah, from the Rebbe Rashab, and um, if you say that a guy doesn't have Bechira Chavshis, then why should be rewarded or be punished if they for for choices if they don't really have free choice and they can't really be uh, held liable or or for what they do? So this is this is the struggle of how to understand this. I, mean, I don't know whether I managed, if I managed to uh, do justice, but I'm just going to read what's here in this letter of the Rebbe. So he says, So what does it mean that there is reward and punishment by Umar Sa'ilam? So he says, Aleph can be the following. The reward and punishment in this context could be a shame ham ush mushal. It could be a borrowed term from the real schar which is related to Bnei Israel. But it's more what he calls his siba mesuba. When a person, he says an example, if a child puts his finger in hot water and scalds his finger. So it's not, uh, it's not a punishment. A small child doesn't know that it's hot water, doesn't know that this is a consequence. But it, the punishment is a consequence of, of, a, of a violation. So he's, it's not like where you know, the idea of schar v'oynish bayidin, which is uh, a, a reward in Gan Eden, et cetera, whatever, which is awaiting them as a reward. But here it's like a, more like a, a consequence of a misconduct. That's, so that's the first point. The second point which the Rebbe says is, that the for the Sheva mitzvahs, which are given to the Bnei Noyach, for this they do have Bechira. So when, so therefore, the second approach seems to be saying that the usage of saying that Umar Sa'ilam do not have Bechira Chavshis, that is in relation to their, what they do to you, what they don't do to you, um, that's where they don't have Bechira Chavshis. When it comes to their own responsibility of Sheva mitzvahs, etc., so then they do have a Bechira Chavshis, and as a result, they are um, they are rewarded accordingly. Okay, let's go on to something more halachadik. Last Friday. So I got a call about two hours before Shabbos, and it was a family that they, some of the girls had lit candles already, their mother was going to light, and I told them that there's a concept of Plag HaMincha, but then was a, the whole thing was a bit new. They're not used to you know, starting Shabbos early. But, um, so the idea that you can't light uh, Shabbos candles before Plaga Mincha, to the point that the girls who had already lit, I said they would have to put out the candle and light it again with a bracha. I told them that you have to wait till after Plaga Mincha. Okay. So then a couple of minutes later, the mother calls me back. She says, well, actually, I realized that last week I also... Oh, and I've lost your sound. Um, can you hear me now? Um, last week, he says, uh, she says, I also didn't, uh, I, I lit earlier. So what's, what's the, uh, what do I do? Do I have to light an extra candle for having not lit on time last week? So here we have from the Alter Rebbe Shechon Aruch, Simeresh Samach Gimel. Okay, 
So um, we have here about the beginning of Simon Reis Samachim on the dinner of lighting candles. So it has here, if a woman forgot once to light candles, so it's customary that she should continue lighting for, for then onwards a third candle. And if she forgot several times, she should keep on each, for each time she forgot, she adds another candle. And this is a kind of, uh, should we call it a kind of penalty, so that she should be more careful in the future and not forget about lighting candles for Shabbos. <clears throat> now, about this thing about lighting an extra candle for forgetting, generally we like to take a, the most lenient way of view possible on this, because it's an element of embarrassment and uh, there's a reluctance that they should have to start lighting extra candles. And here, in this case, it wasn't as if she did not light candles. She lit them too early. And so it came Shabbos, or sorry, it came Plaga Mincha. So the candles were there. So it's not a neglect, which should be where, which warrants a penalty. It was a miscalculation, but I didn't, I didn't feel it was necessary to apply the knas, the, the penalty in this case. Okay, let's move on. On. Next question was, okay, so I had a question for, uh, earlier this week. A, uh, other people seem to be able to hear. What, I don't know what to do. Um, so there's someone traveling from um, Paris, is traveling to Nice. He's traveling in the morning, leaving house, or whatever in the morning, and there perhaps for a family for, um, uh, event, and later at night is going to take a plane back. So he's asking, should I say Tfilah Saderech on the way out and on the way back? So to explain the question a little bit more, we have here a question: What is Tfilah Saderech? Is Tfilah Saderech for the journey, a prayer for the journey? Or is Tfilah Saderech a prayer on the day that you're going to be traveling? Where does this make a difference? If you're going to have a journey which takes a few days, if it's a bracha for the journey, so you say it once for the journey. If it's a bracha for every day that you're traveling, for the day of traveling, so then it's never several days, you should say one each day. And it's for this reason, there's two opinions in Poskim. It's for this reason that. The Alter Rebbe says, when you're traveling over several days, you should say Tfilah Sader the first time with Hashem's name at the end. And after that, you should say Tfilah Sader every day whilst you are on, in the journey, even whilst you're staying in a hotel. He says you should continue saying Tfilah Sader without Hashem's name at the end, just say Baruch HaToshem Ea Tfilah. And that is because of these two opinions, whether Tfilah Sader is for the journey or for the day. And since it's a new day, as far as I say, to us the day again. Now, let's take the same question. Is it for the day or for the journey? What about if you are traveling and coming back on the same day? So it's the same day. As far as the day is concerned, you've had a Tfilah Sader for the day. If you're doing several journeys in one day, it's all included in the Tfilah for the day. If it's Tfilah Sader, is for the journey. So each journey, um, so each journey should be a, a, a separate filler. And this is where the Alter Rebbe in our Siddha, we have if he says im daito lach zemiyad, you should say v'sach zireinu l'shala. Because you're going to do a journey back. So if you if you go according to the Svara, it's for the journey, you should say it again. If you say it's according to the Yoim, you've already said for the for this Yoim. In order to solve this problem, the Alter Rebbe says, in the morning, Tefillah, you'll, when you're going out, you'll say Vesach Zireinu L'Shalev. And this way, it covers, the, that Tefillah will cover the return journey also. Now, here comes the question, though, when the First, the outgoing journey is in the day, and the return journey is at night. So this is where the question is. Is it, is it considered the same day? So here you have a quote from 
Shevet HaLevi from Rav Vosner's Zichrona Levracha, where someone's asking one who's traveling by day and is coming by night. Does he have to say to us again? And he says, um, don't don't belaylo. Um, he says if you stay overnight, you'd have to do tefillah sadek again. But if it's uh, if it's there and back the same day, you don't have to make tefillah sadek again. So although la halacha the day normally switches at sunset me'erev aderev, but for example, it comes to birchas hatayra. So we say a birchas hatayra in the morning. And when it comes sunset, we don't say Birchas again at sunset. Aye, it's a new day. And the answer is that because when you said, the Rabbeinu Yoida says this in Brachas, he says, when you said Birchas in the morning, you had in mind that if I don't manage to cover my, uh, my, 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 my shiurim during the day, I will be marshaling by night. So the night is the overflow of the limudim of the day. By that, by taking that svara, we'll use the same for the Tvila Saderech. That it's the, 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 uh, the night journey is a conscious, how do you say, a continuation of what, you, when you made the Tvila in the morning, you had in mind um, that the, the following night also. Whereas if you've gone to sleep, you don't have, then you do have a Hesach Adas, it's a new day. So if you go overnight, you'd make another time Tvila Saderech. But if it's on the same day, it would still be included in the Tfilas Haderach of the morning. Okay. Someone, one of our listeners asked me a question. What do you do? What can you do if you have a swarm of ants which have gathered on a windowsill? Are you allowed to, on Shabbos? Are you allowed to brush them away? Are you allowed to blow them away? So... There's an introduction in the Gemara, one who kills a louse is as if he killed a camel. A louse is alive and a camel is alive. And there's no difference in the malocha of killing a louse as to killing a camel. So you're not allowed to kill even a small animal, small creature. So what I'm reading here, and this is for the Piskei Shuvas, in Shin Tazai, and there it talks about issues of bugs, trapping bugs, closing a, a chest where there might be um, flies inside. Meanwhile, he says here on Shabbos, when you're washing the dishes and washing the table, the uh, countertop, if there are um, ants or other um, pests which are there, you, should, you can blow them away or um, with your mouth. Or you can move them lightly with a, whether it's a stick or with a, with a, a brush, but not to sprinkle water in a way that for sure, most likely they will die because of it. They also talk about what happens if you see in the, in the toilet bowl, if you see some flies, would you be allowed to flush, which would then possibly be killing the, the, uh, the flies. But let's keep to our, our question here. So he's saying that you, obviously you cannot uh, use a more forceful way of brushing away these these ants. He does say you can blow them, which I find actually interesting. I didn't have a chance to go through this further. If you remember, some of us have been um, following this for a, a long time. A while ago, we had a discussion about taking a book off the shelf on Shabbos and blowing off the air, the, the dust. And I quoted then a uh, source saying that that is a subsidiary of Zoire, that's using air power, wind power, to separate bad from good. And they said that you're not allowed to do that, which for me that was a surprise at the time. But if that's the case, if blowing off, blowing off dust from the, from the top of a book is a problem of Zoire, so I'm not sure why you should be allowed to blow those, those ants either. Um, using a light brush, perhaps, um, and because of mooks, uh, that's a, that's a question. No, he's, he's, he's suggesting it because it's tiltum in Hatsad, which really is a bit of a shvacha thing because the Alter Rebbe disagrees with the Taz. The Taz says that if you take a knife and you sh shove away the crumbs at the table, 
that's called Tiltul Min Hatsad, and he allows it. The Alter Rebbe says that's not Tiltul Min Hatsad, that's called Yodo Arichto, and it's extension of your hand, and you wouldn't be allowed to do that. You wouldn't be allowed to move Muksa with a knife. What is called Tiltul Min Hatsad is when you come to your favorite armchair and there are coins on it, which are not comfortable to sit on, so you'll tilt the armchair so that the coins fall off. That says the Alter Rebbe, that's called Tiltul Min Hatsad. But to use a tool to move things, in, um, he, say he sees that as a yodo arichto. So I don't see using a stick as being a solution uh, of tiltum outside from Buxa. So really, I'm, I'm a little bit stuck. I'm just saying blowing, I'm worried about Zaira. Using a stick, I'm worried about Muksa. Um, so I'm not really sure what the solution is. Um, let's go back to the previous question. Someone is raising the point that surely if the lady lit before the plug, then the candles are still burning after the plug. And therefore you're saying, therefore the mitzvah was done. She's, you're saying that perhaps there was a brachal of atola, but the mitzvah, but she would have done the mitzvah. Yeah, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm inclined to agree with you that um, it's even more, the, the contemporary poskim say, you know, she didn't light candles, but the electric light was on. They say, no, that's not good enough because there the electric light wasn't done the shame mitzvah at all. But here in this case, she lit before the plug. It, she did do the act of shame mitzvah. It, it wasn't valid, but it wasn't dark either. And they were there on time. So yes, I, I would go along with that. So at the point we've said that she didn't, doesn't need to have a penalty of lighting another candle um, you know, for future weeks. Let's go on to the next question. This is a very uh, a hot contemporary question. So <clears throat> this question was from somewhere uh, in the United States, Long Island somewhere. And this a Jewish fellow says that he works in a, in a school, yeshiva, whatever it may be. And there's another person working in this school. I understood the other person was Jewish. And this person has gone through a, a procedure and from now on wants to be referred to in the feminine form rather than the masculine form. And so now the person is asking, am I allowed to cooperate with that request or should I not cooperate? So this, I don't know exactly the details of what this person did and Lalocha, the, this, uh, this procedure does not change the person's status. The person is still um, feminine or masculine the way they were created. Whatever they've done to themselves, you can say they mutilated themselves, but it doesn't change their status. Very interesting that I'm um, sure those who followed the news recently um, in about the sports, uh, there's been a whole thing about um, that men who have gone through a procedure well, are disqualified from women's sports. And so the, uh, the Metziah says it doesn't change the person. All right, now let's now look at the halacha. We have a, a, a postdoc in Torah, a man shouldn't don a woman's garment. Says Rashi, I'm sure it's from the uh, um, for the Sifra, Sifri, what's the use of a man dressing up in a woman's clothing to enable him to mingle amongst the women? So this procedure, or this trans procedure, whatever it is exactly, is I think it's a, it's a violation, it's a clear violation of in the most uh, radical way, I think. Now, if a person has done an Aveda, so then we have a Mishnah, I came across this Mishnah, I'll say there I'm learning, Mishnayas and Shviyas, if someone does something wrong, you can be nice to the person, but you cannot bless them. You cannot, um, um, con how do you say, congratulate them for something which is an Aveda. And therefore, to, 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 uh, to acknowledge that something has happened here and their, their status has changed, I think is, is, is uh, inappropriate. Uh, it's so, Whilst I was here in Crown Heights, I was asked uh, to give a shear in one of the shuls. So 
So Baruch Hashem, you know, the, uh, the panorama yeah, yeah. is something. The panorama is available. It's ready, you know, stuff which I have to hand. So I discussed this Shiloh. So listen to this. So one of the people said at the Shear that in, in, in the United States, if a person wants to have such a procedure, they have to give, they have to be given, sorry, they have to give a signed document that they are sane, that they are balanced, that they're not doing it, not the Meshugas. And it has to be signed like an affidavit of some sort by someone responsible. Uh, like employer or someone who's confirms that this person is acting um, you know, conscious and aware of what they're doing, etc. So now comes a Goyish worker to his Jewish employer and he says, I want to make this procedure and I want you to give a haskome, not in the procedure, that I am uh, that I'm of sane of mind. Is a Jewish, is a Yid allowed to give that, uh, that haskome? Now, it goes a little bit further. I mean, the question here is, I've said it's loyal, but she gave a similar issue. Is a Goy allowed to do this procedure? And if, if, if he's not allowed to, then it's a, I'm not allowed to um, support them doing it in Avera. If a Goy is allowed to do this procedure, um, then, yeah, I mean, this, this is the question. Am I allowed to assist a Goy in going through such a procedure? I don't have clear um, a clear answer on that. I had a question from a teacher this week that one of the girls in school has got a mishigas of writing on their skin, writing on their arms and pictures, writing. And the teacher obviously told her it's inappropriate. The girl said, "What's wrong with it?" So I, at, what I said to the teacher, the Umar Soilam have got the impression that Hashem has given them a canvas. And they can put on the canvas what they want, uh, on, the, uh, the, the, on the, the body and their hands and the face or whatever. That's not true. We are part of Hashem's canvas. We are, we're not, we're Hashem, we, are, we are created in, in Selah Malikim. And Hashem has created us in a particular way to project in a certain way. And we shouldn't be mutilating that. So it's not respectful for Selah Malikim to be uh, all, all uh, you know, graffiti all, all over. Um, so in that thought, okay, that should apply to Umar Sa'il also. But to make from that an Isur, and, and it, apparently it also involves, it can be a lot, involved a lot of money, um, could be court cases, etc. So I don't know how strong you could say, take that, not, not cooperating with a guy who wants to go through such a procedure. Okay, let's move on. I mean, then they said, I mean, it's not normal. The, the word normal is a little bit elastic. And when something becomes very wide, uh, widespread, it's difficult to use the term, it's not normal. Um, there's a famous word about someone came to, I think it was a Tzorov, he says, my, my, my son has gone to sugar. So the Rebbe said to him, this is the Rebbe, we don't, know, we don't know who it was. No, no. If he would, if he would eat shikstas and dance with chazerim, is there is a meshuggah. If he's dancing with, eating chazer and dancing with shikstas, it's a baltaibu. Okay, let's move on. Um, a question came through this week about a family, Zayda, Baba, grandchildren, children, grandchildren, and they want to do something spectacular. Uh, they're renting a yacht for a, for a week, from Tuesday till Sunday. And it's just the family. It's not not a not a cruise on a on a bigger group. It's just just the family, and the uh, crew of the yacht are uh, professionals who go to professionals. So asking whether they would be allowed to. What should they do about Shabbos? So, Be'emes, it's a fairly straightforward halacha in Simeresh Memchas, where it says you're allowed to travel with a ship on Erev Shabbos if it's for Advar Mitzvah, and you should, you should agree with the sailor, the captain, that is going to halt for Shabbos, and if the captain 
decides to push on, it's not, not your problem. You shouldn't travel out of Shabbos. Rather, you should travel at least three days before Shabbos. So there's this difference between Dvar Mitzvah and Dvar Horshus has been addressed here because they're traveling on Tuesday. So that's not a problem. And the, the guidance should be that they should say to the, to the caption, to the uh, whoever it is, that as far as we're concerned, we have no interest to travel further on Shabbos. If you wanted to stop wherever we are, and that would be fine. But, um, and if the captain decides to keep on traveling, that's for themselves, not for you. Now, <clears throat> this, this famously, the Rebbe was very involved in the saga of Israeli ships traveling on Shabbos. It was, it was in the 50s, there was an Israeli company called Sim, which is the, one of the words in Hebrew for a boat uh, or ferry, whatever. And they would, they would travel from Israel to the United States. And they uh, were many Jewish passengers. And the Rebbe saw this as a major Chil Hashem, that Jewish, uh, a Jewish boat, a Jewish um, uh, um, is, is traveling, Jewish owned boat is traveling on Shabbos. And the Rebbe here shows his understanding, his knowledge of how boats work. He says, don't just talk about the travel, talk about the logbook, talk about the, the water purifying system, talk about, you know, he goes through various me mechanics which are involved in running a boat. And some of them are not 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 um, pikuach nefesh. Keeping a logbook is not pikuach nefesh, but it's it's a legal requirement. And so he's saying there's lots of things which are going on which uh, which are forbidden to be done on Shabbos. But there, the difference being that there you're talking about a Jewish operated the the the, the captain and the crew are are hidden. That's why the Rebbe took such exception to it. Here we're talking about it's uh, operated by goyim. And you've taken contract, and then if they do their own thing to keep on traveling, uh, that seems to be quite okay. Uh, and the fact that they're going to do the logbook and the, the various other systems, well, they also want to drink water, so they want to have a water, water purifying system in operation. That's for themselves rather than for you. So let's move on. So here came up a question um, about a sepatoida, which was felt it was too heavy for. The people, most of the people in the shul to lift, and someone had decided that they're going to trim off some of the parchment. The sefer has this requirement: there should be a margin on top, the size of three etz boys. The margin at the bottom should be four etz boys. So I don't know the details whether they left that margin or they cut into that margin. It's obviously they didn't ask. Uh, doesn't look like look like they asked. Shiloh by anyone very competent. Um, but are you allowed to do this? Are you allowed to trim off uh, the margins? Now, if you remember last week, we had the story of, um, of a piece of silver pendant, which has a Shem's name on the pendant. And we said that the, not only is the Shem sacred, but also the rest of the pendant is also sacred because it's like the margins of a Sefer Kodesh. And so here too, the, even, the, even the excess, even if the excess um, margin, in other words, you've got beyond the three etz boys and the four etz boys, you've got more of that because that's part of the unit of the uh, Sefer Torah, then that also has been kind of absorbed in the Kedusha of the Sefer Torah and to start cutting it off is something which should not be done unless, 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 if not, it was going to be put in shames. If it's so extraordinarily heavy that really it's not possible to pick up, then, okay, then, then nothing, then that safer toe is in its current form is useless and it would be justified to start trimming it. But if in the more likely scenario, that yes, it, it is heavy and most people cannot lift it, but there are, a few young strapping fellows who can. So then that would not be grounds to start trimming off the parchment of the Sefer This is what you have the Psak of Rav Vosner. Again, this is for Shevet HaLevi, um, where he was asked this question, and now I'm just reading his text about trimming off. I'm, I'm quite hesitant about this. Even it's a very heavy Sefer but they are the Baalei Koya who are able to lift it. 
even though because of its heaviness, it's not going to be used on such a regular basis. But that's not a reason to actually, uh, how do you say, um, that it's going to have to be put into Geniza, into Seamus, unless it's extremely, extremely heavy, which is very unusual. Um, and therefore, no, he doesn't allow you to trim off the margins. If the margins were trimmed off, does that disqualify the Sifatayra? Um, unfortunately, I, I don't have the answer to that. There are many in Yonim, the, uh, that's in other words, I've said there has to be a margin of three to, um, at Zboros at the top and four at the bottom. Um, I would imagine that those are Lechatchila guidelines. The Rambam says a lot of these things, or most of these things, are all in Yonim Lechatchila, but if they weren't followed through, um, that would not pass all the Sifatayra. I don't think the margins, the lack of margins, would be a reason to disqualify Sifatayra. Um, I'm saying that as speculation. Right. Here I just want to share with you an interesting um, Shaila, an interesting, well, application. The Torah says that if you lent an, uh, an animal, let's say I, I own a, an ox, and someone comes to borrow the ox. My name is Reuven, Shimon borrows the ox, goes out to the field, and there is an accident, and the ox gets damaged. So he's liable. He's liable for accidents. What happens if I'm not only generous with the ox, I'm also generous with my time. And I went out to help him to start plowing. And then afterwards, he continues plowing, and there was an accident later. So here is a halochalo, it's a tajse, it's a kzeresakosu that the, the borrower does not have to pay for the damage. But all of imoy lo yashale. That's a possible in Chumash and Pashas and Shpotim, but all of imoy lo yashale. So when you loaned your property and you loaned yourself in the same setting, I'm not going to go all the details, it's a lot of more about Mansi, a lot of halachas, but if you loaned yourself along with the loan of your article, that is reason for the borrower not to be liable for an accident. So here's the question. I'm going to, um, I, I was, someone asked me, can I give them a ride to this and this simcha? And so, yeah, I, I give them a ride. We come there and I also want to go in. And so he offers to park the car. So he goes and parks the car. Meanwhile, there's a truck, a lorry, uh, which backs up and smashes the headlight. So now is the driver, who, 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 who's my passenger, who now um, took taken the car to park it, is he liable for the damage to the light? So according to what we've just said, if I was doing him a favor of taking him to this venue, so I'm lending him the use of my car and I'm giving him personal service also. I'm driving, I'm driving him. The fact that afterwards, as part of this journey, there was a, an accident. So I felt that he's not liable on the, on the basis of the rule of Babaylim because it was a loan of the owner as well as the, as the uh, loan of the article. Uh, just a couple of days ago, and a new question, a couple of days ago, I got an email following on from our discussion some time back about Parshas Bechukhoisai. That's about, about, about five, six weeks ago. And someone had asked, what do we do if um, if the Balkhoire, on the peak of the Teuchachor, if the Balkhoire is a lady or a koyan? Because normally the Balkhoire takes that aliyah but um, because we don't want to call up someone for to be honored to be the hear the Torah, so we don't like to personalize it. So normally the Balkhoi just takes that aliyah without being called up. But what happens if, it's a, if the Balkhoi is a levi or, or a koyan? So he takes a Rishon Hashani, and in Bukhakhoi, the Torah is Shlishi, in Pashas Kisovoi, the Torah is Shishi. So Mr. Bura, Sim Tov says, in this case, let the coin or the levy take their aliyah on all the way till the end of Shlishi. 
So Balkhoyle will take it, will go, go to the end of Shlishi, and now you give whatever were left, instead of dividing into five, you'll divide it, instead of dividing into four, you divide, divide it into five. You'll accommodate the seven aliyahs later on by dividing one of those aliyahs into two, or into three, whatever, maybe, however you'll work it out. What do you do about Pashas Kisar, right? There, so there the Mishabura says, get your seven aliyahs until Shishi. And then from Shishi till the end of the Sedra will be Akhran. And the, the Akhoyan can leave, you can have Akhran. At the time I had said that that won't work for Chabad because we don't do Hesophis. We don't do more than the seven aliyahs plus the Maftu. So someone wrote to me, he says that the reason for that is only because in the times of the Gemara, the Mishnah, which says you can have his office, that in those times, the Balkhoire, the person would read their own Aliyah. Now, that because of the Balkhoire reading, therefore, it's uh, we don't do his office. But here, but he is reading the actual extra Aliyah, so why should there be a hesitation? Why couldn't we have uh, uh, an Akhrin since the Balkhoire himself is late? So actually, the source, and why am I discussing it now? It's relevant for this coming Shabbos, where Gimel Tammuz, every Chosid of the Rebbe, will want to have an Aliyah, the covered Gimel Tammuz. And there's not enough uh, in, in one Kriya Satayr. So we look at the letter which the Rebbe wrote, leading up to Yud Shvat, Tov Shin Yud Aleph, the first Yorzeit of the Fredik Rebbe. And he says the Shabbos, before the Yorzeit, each person should be mishtadl, should try to have an aliyah. If there's not enough aliyahs for the chassidim to have, to have each an aliyah, they should read the Torah in separate rooms, but not to be moisir al misper hakurim, not to not to have a shofts. And in the footnote, there's a reference to the Tzemach Tzedek in Simon Lamed Hay in Erechaim in Shuvas, where he discusses this at length. And I just want to explain a little bit. The question here is, I know we've discussed this before, but uh, I'm sure it's worth refreshing. What is the meaning of, why, what is a pshat? You've said in the morning, you said birchas and now at, at uh, whatever the time is, eight o'clock or 10 o'clock, you're now in show, and they call you up to the Torah, and you're saying birchas again. Why are you making a birchas You've said birchas the answer is because I'm leaning now, but Rabbim, it's a different story. It's a bigger thing. I'm, I'm, I'm reading in Torah in public, in a, in a congregational setting. Wonderful. That's all very well if you are yourself a leaning. You are leaning now in a more privileged setting. So you make a special brach. What are the Balkhoyde is leaning? What are you making a brach? Why are you making a brach if, if he's leaning? So the Rosh says, that indeed, that when you have an Alira Torah, you should be saying the words together with the Balkhoyer quietly. That doesn't really answer the question. Because the fact that you are murmuring, you know, an undertone, along with the Balkhoyer, you are not doing anything. You're just standing there. It's the Balkhoyer who's doing the... the, the uh, he's, he's doing the, pu the public broadcast. You are just standing there. And indeed... The Masas bin Yomi, who was a contemporary of the Ramo, I believe. In his Sefer, he learns differently to the Rosh. And he learns that nowadays, in the olden times, each person would have an Aliyah and they would lay, read, read their own piece. Nowadays, what's happening? It's as if you have a community that is only one literate person. All the nine out of ten are illiterate. There's only one literate person. And says in Shukhan Aruch, if that's the case, this literate person should have seven aliyahs. He'll, he'll re make a bracha, tchil of a soif, sit down, yamoid, again, he'll sum it again, again, bracha before, lane, after bracha, sit down, and so on. He's going to have seven aliyahs one after the other. What's happening now is, because most of us are not seasoned Bale Kriya, so we've got a Balkhoyer, and he is having seven aliyahs. Instead of him saying his bracha seven times, 14 times, and it's 14 brachas, so what's happening is we have a Koyen and a Levin and Yisrael, another Yisrael, and they are saying the brachas for the Balkhoyer. They are saying it on behalf of the Balkhoyer. Really, the Balkhoyer should be saying these brachas. 
And we are saying the broch is on behalf of the Balkan. But effectively, in our setting, in the current con con contemporary setting, it is the Balkoire who's having three aliyahs, seven aliyahs, and we are honoring people to say the brochus for him. Now, going back to that illiterate setting, where there's only one literate person, and as a Takan you have to have seven aliyahs. He has seven aliyahs. How about he's getting near the end? He says, you know, this is going so gishmak. I'm going to want to give myself a high off. I want to have an eighth aliyah. I want to have a ninth aliyah. Of course, that's, that wouldn't be legitimate because the whole, it's all a kind of stretching to accommodate. He should be able to, that, um, that we should be able to have the seven aliyahs. But don't do a sophos in that. And so coming back, is there any difference whether the balkoira will be, whether, whether the achrin is someone else leaning or you yourself leaning? It doesn't matter. The word is, by the time you've gotten to achrin, you've already have seven, seven aliyahs, Reb balkoira. And therefore, it's not, not according to the Masters of Binyomen, you shouldn't be giving yourself an eighth aliyah. And therefore, what, so what is the solution? Coming back, so again, so they would just retrace. We're talking about Parshish Kisovitz, but in Shishi, how do, and the Balkhoid is a Lakhoin or a Levi. So the Mishnah Brewer says he should, um, we should give that as Achrin to the, to the Balkhoid. And I'm saying that wouldn't work for Chabad because we don't do a sophist. And even though he's going to be the Balkhoire himself for that Achrin, uh, instead, uh, you just have, let's say, the Gabe or someone will have that Aliyah with, without being called up. Same same idea as the Balkhoire, but someone else will have that Aliyah without being called up. Let's move on. No, we've been discussing the last, was it last week or two weeks ago, about the Cholns with the Bali. I want to confirm. And after last week's shear, I was told uh, with authority that the challenge in 770 does not contain barley. Well, that, that barley was not part of the recipe. And therefore, what was the reason that the later of Marlo asking that it's Zonus was because of the kishka, but not like a neat balabatishka kishka sitting on the top of the challenge and then cut up uh, at serving time. No, it would have already been um, duly um, broken up into pieces and therefore in every ladle as you pick up a ladle of chon they would also have a chunk of kishka there too which is mazoinus and that would therefore dominate that the mixture is mazoinus. Meanwhile came up a question what about what about if it's a cholent which just contains meat and potatoes, beans and potatoes, no barley, it does contain meat. Does the meat require a separate bracha? Now this is, again, a milsa de is a common thing. Um, does the meat in a cholent require a separate bracha? So here's very interesting. Let's say you have a, a salad, um, carrots and whatever, and you put in raisins. You don't make a separate broch on the raisins in the salad because they are there to flavor the salad. If the salad is basically a vegetable salad, you've got a few raisins, they are there to flavor it. But let's read this from the Alter Rebbe in Bechasanen in Perikvov Halochayud. And he's talking here about foods, um, vegetables, let's say, which have been cooked. And he says if they were. If they were, uh, let's say, um, it's not, he says, if, if it was downgraded and then it was upgraded again, it was it was spoiled by having a kind of, uh, a food is not normally cooked and it was cooked, so it was spoiled. And then you put, put in sugar or something and then it made it nice and gishmak. You know, the um, cherries, the ones which you have the on the, the birthday cakes, so those cherries go through a, a stage where they are totally inedible. And then they kind of do a trias amesim and they become, become gishmaka cherries. So what the shayla is, what brocha do you make? Yeah? I remember there a blazer, a table by my Lord was saying that you bamish, that it goes to a stage, it's like a piece of paper, like a piece of cardboard. So there we have the aloha, that you have a food which was spoiled by cooking, and then it was revived with honey. So the brocha is revived also. 
So now let's read the next piece, which is relevant to our discussion. If you took apples or whatever and you cooked them, fried them in the honey or in with meat, or at least they weren't worse than when they were um, fresh. So if you took peaches, apricots, and you cooked them with chicken, so the um, so the apricots remain, and the, the apricots got also geschmack. So then the brocha remains for eight. But then he adds in the brackets, this is where it, was, it threw me. Let's take this uh, example of, of, of apricots and, and chicken cooked together. But there is pieces of, there are pieces of chicken. So that is not tofu. But so now I'm, I'm very puzzled. What's the, why should meat in a, such a dish of cooked vegetables, why should that meat be more, uh, a certain more of a uh, independence or of a, a presence, whatever, more so than uh, the, the raisins in a vegetable salad? And what should be the difference? So actually what you have underneath here is um, the notes of Mavro Malashvili, where he published it for the Birchus uh, Anen in lots of notes. And his, his, for his first suggestion is that the meat here was cooked to be eaten separately. Again, I'm also learning this bashing again. I'm going to ask you a katavsha. It wasn't cooked that the meat and the, should be eaten together. It was cooked with the fruit, but then the, the meat would be then put away to be eaten separately. Then sometimes people put in a meat in a chalant, a large chunk of meat, and then they take the meat away and put it uh, separately and serve it separately. If that's the case, then the bossor is not toffled to the parents. But if he cooked it in order to eat it together, then it should be included with the brocha of the, of the, uh, of the vegetables. That's his first approach. Oyef Shalomar, that perhaps no, perhaps meat is different to the case of the, the raisins in the salad, because the meat is kosher, in relation to Paris, and he gives a reference to Paris, Zion to, to save you time. There is talking about a soup. As you may know, that sometimes a vegetable soup is made of priyadama. If you cooked vegetables and the, together with a, with a soup, with a, with, a, with a liquid, and you even have this, if you have that soup, even without any vegetables, that soup is adama. What happens if you had vegetables and meat? There, the soup becomes a shahar. Because between, in this liquid called soup, you've got two components. You've got meat and vegetables. So the meat becomes the more dominant one and becomes the, the soup becomes the shahakal. But there, there is, that's a different story with all due respect to Rabbi Alashvili. There, it's a question, is the soup hashakal or hadam? Here we have a different story. We've got a chon, which is no question that is hadam. What do we do about the meat, chunks of meat in it? Does it have a separate brocha or is it included in the hadam? So the fact that meat over kind of overrides the vegetable taste in a soup is not a proof that the meat should become a, a, a standalone element in the children to require separate brach. So um, so he, he see he's struggling with this. So there's a couple of uh, Ingalite I was sitting with today, and someone came up with a very interesting explanation, which I, I like and I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you. When you have raisins in a salad, if you take it now, you'll take the raisins. Why do you have the? You only have a certain taste. The raisins give a certain flavor to the salad. If you'll put the salad the raisins in, and then just before you serve the salad, you take the raisins out. The salad will not have a raisin flavor. With meat, if you cooked your chalent with meat, and you removed the meat, the chalent will still have. A, 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 a meaty flavor. So it's done its job of flavoring, and now it's here, not as a flavoring, but as a food. And therefore, that's what he's suggesting. That's why the Alter Rebbe is saying here, you can see quite clearly, I think 
the first approach is, is doesn't fit in the words of the Alter Rebbe. He's saying if it's the Shuman Abbasur, if it's just the, the flavor, the fat of the meat in the vegetables, then if it's just the flavor, then it, it, it's included in the Hadam. But if the Bosor, if it's the boss is visible, if it's ch ch visible chunks, not to tiny little slivers, but if it's visible chunks of meat, then they do not become tough because they've done their job of flavoring. They are still present there as a food. And therefore, so the Bascona, it looks like that if you have a cholent and visible chunks of meat, you should be making a separate bracha shahakal on those chunks of meat. Um, I spoke to Rabbi Hela today I went into the coil and he says, Chult, you should have during you should wash it until you die and have it during a Shabbos meal. This whole business of having chult. Um Shalai is a yeah. All right, I wish you all a good Khaidish and a good Shabbos and an inspiring uh Gimel Tamas should come bring to Achlotus Tavis and uh Zaitali Gizans. Amen.